I would like to tell you are some things that are going really well at the Board of Pharmacy. I feel like there's really strong leadership there, specifically our executive director, Susan McCoy, is doing a great job. Um, I think our board members um, have a great um, group dynamic right now. And as you mentioned, so many different settings in the practice of pharmacy. I feel like we reflect a lot on the decisions we're making, trying to keep of course, the public safety and patient safety, the very top of mind, um, trying not to have unnecessary barriers for uh, pharmacy owners and other business folks in the pharmacy industry to grow their business. Um, it certainly needs to be safe, and so that's our role, to think about um, things that are being asked of us, to visit with pharmacists that um, are trying to do a good job, may have made a misstep, and so we've really as I said, have had a lot of reflection on, on what's the best path forward, working within our regulations to give them a path forward um, if there is one, um, and again, keep patient safety and public safety top of mind as we do that. Uh, as you know, pharmacists nowadays are able to perform uh, procedures and, and, and have a, a scope of practice that's uh, larger than it was traditionally what sort of uh, challenges and uh, opportunities do you see in those changes? Yeah, so of course in our regulations we have the collaborative practice agreement opportunity uh, for any pharmacist that may want to work with a physician um, to um, support them and their work and to support the patient care that the physicians provide to their patients and the pharmacist um, can work collaboratively with them as outlined in an agreement um, and that would be in the scope of a pharmacist to do. Uh, we get a lot of questions from our licensed pharmacists in the state of Mississippi about um, is it okay if I do this or what is an appropriate way to do this. Um, the collaborative practice agreement um, is a, a great way that provides boundaries, the right boundaries, um, but that working collaboratively with a physician um, would still keep the pharmacist um, in their scope. And um, I know that during the early days of the pandemic, uh, the representation was made, at least by Walgreens and CVS, that they wish to bring in, I assume, their employees from other states to provide uh, inoculations in, in nursing homes. And there was some concern about the speed with which the board reacted to that. I think it was ultimately resolved. I don't know if you were involved in that or had any uh, views on that to share with us. Yeah, I think as soon as the Board of Pharmacy was aware that there was a need, uh, we were happy to visit about that and address that. And we did that through allowing uh, temporary licensing of those out-of-state pharmacists so that they could come in and do that COVID-19 specific work. And so we were happy to work with those pharmacies in that way. Do other members of the committee have questions? Comments? If not, is there a motion? Oh, there's a motion to advise and consent. Are you ready to vote? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Ayes appear to have it, the ayes have it. Uh, we'll take the nomination up on the floor within the next couple of days as the uh, timetable and all that the Senate permits. But thank you again for coming down and visiting with us. Thank you for serving on the board and good luck getting back to Olive Branch. Thank you. Uh, Senate nomination number 55, uh, Dr. John Daniel Davis, Dr. Davis, would you, be, would you be nice enough to come and visit with us and tell us about the, uh, your ideas about the State Board of Health and a bit about yourself if you'd like to? Sure. Well. Thank you very much, Senator. It's an honor to be here and it's an honor to be considered for the, uh, for the Board of Health. Um, day to day, uh, my work centers around being a neurosurgeon and taking care of patients with various neurosurgical problems. Um, but when I was in my residency training program, I had the opportunity to get a master's degree in health finance and management. Uh, that was taught out of the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. So I shared a lot of uh, classes with uh, people who were in the Masters of Public Health um, program. Um, 
that really seeded in me a, a great interest in, in matters of, uh, of public health. And I've observed uh, the work of the Department of Health, particularly during this uh, pandemic, with a great deal uh, of interest. And uh, I think that this, this pandemic, uh, if it hasn't, it certainly should have humbled all of us uh, in one way or another because I think we've learned as we've worked through it that we have a whole lot to learn and um, that at the outset of this pandemic none of us really knew exactly where this was going to go and I have great respect for Dr. Dobbs and I have great respect for other members of the Department of Health for the remarkable work that they've done. I think um, managing the state's response to this pandemic in a way that was very balanced uh, based on uh, science and with the interest of the well-being of the people of Mississippi being first and foremost. So when I was offered the opportunity for a nomination to serve on the Department of Health, uh, it was an easy um, opportunity to say, to say yes to. And when I was told that I would possibly be filling the shoes of, of my friend uh, Tad, Tad Barham, then uh, that made it even, uh, even, even more so. Well, thank you. You, you. you mentioned Dr. Dobbs in the pandemic. I'll just tell you what I told him early on in this, that he was making all sorts of mistakes right and left every day, and two or three years from now, I'd tell him what they were. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I think I think that uh, your your comments about it being an humbling humbling experience for all of us. I think we got a lot of things right, but it's also the case that we learned a lot, and it's good that we learned a lot. What are there any particular matters or interests at the state uh, Department of Health that have uh, attracted your interest, or is it just a general interest in the provision of health care throughout the state? Sure. I mean, that, that, I think for me, it's just an overall interest in public health. I mean, one of the things that we run into in healthcare, really in every um, arena of healthcare, is um, the reality that there are financial limitations. Um, there's not an unlimited uh, pot of money that we can spend on health care as a nation, and that certainly that, that we are capable of spending on health care in general in Mississippi. And uh, we have a lot of uh, people in our state who are um, vulnerable from a health care perspective when you study um, the statistics on the health of our population. So the opportunity to be involved in some way in the most efficient spending of the money that we do have to provide for the well-being, the physical and, and, and mental health well-being of our population here in Mississippi is something that has uh, great interest to me. Thank you. I think Senator Wiggins indicated he had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and uh, Doctor, you kind of touched on it, um, and that's about the pandemic and what we uh, learned uh, and I'm sure we will do a as time goes on a post-mortem of how we did it. that that was a pun by the way <laughs> nobody got it but um okay now they got it um so put I post think we got it Senator Wiggins we were just trying to overlook I was it. trying thank you I'll move on um so we'll do a post-mortem of what what went on but since you're in public health, it seems to me like, honestly, and I guess nationally, but also maybe statewide, at first we weren't prepared. And it seems to me, having served on public health, public health is about uh, education a lot of ways and how we do that. So my question to you is, what did we get wrong? Uh, you said some of the things that we got right. What did we get wrong, and how can we avoid that going forward? Well, I think that if you look at the earliest days of this pandemic, there was a preparedness issue. And I think we 
we wrestle with conflicting needs. One is to be as prepared as we possibly can be for every possible scenario in healthcare that, that, that can impact our citizens like a pandemic. But again, given the fact that we don't have limitless funds, you can't really prepare for everything that is going to come, come at you. I think that um, some some stockpile of, of PPE, that was a huge deal uh, early on. We're clearly past that now, but uh, you know that was a, a matter of, of, of crisis at our hospitals. I can remember getting daily emails from one of the hospitals where I'm on staff describing various PP personal protection, I should know what the E stands for, I can't remember what it is right now, but you know, these are masks, these are gowns, and, and in each category, they listed how many days of supply they had um, until they ran out, um, just to keep the medical staff apprised of, of where we stood. So I do think that it, 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 at a very reasonable cost, we have the opportunity to take items that don't really, they're not perishable, and, and be stockpiled and prepared should another pandemic come along because I, I think that was the um, that was what stood out to me in the earliest days was our ability or inability or the fear that we would become unable to protect the health care providers our, 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 our nurses and our physicians um, and I think we could do a better job in the future being prepared I don't think we can predict what the next virus is that will come our way, but I think that is a cost-efficient way for us to be better prepared for an infectious pandemic in the future. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? If not, uh, I, would, I would say to you and the other nominees, um, and I've said this many times, the members of this public health committee simply won elections. That doesn't mean we know anything about public health. And, and we rely in particular on the State Department of Health to provide us information and, and suggestions about public policy. So in your tenure, if there's anything you think needs to come to our attention, please let us know. Uh, having said that, is there a motion? There's a motion to advise and consent. Debate, are you ready to vote? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, the ayes appear to have it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Davis, we thank, thank you for being willing to serve and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, to you. thanks to the committee. Uh, Senate nomination number 62, Dr. Roderick Clarence Givens, Dr. Givens. Uh, Dr. Givens, just tell us a bit about yourself. This is an appointment to the Board of Medical Licensure and anything you would have to share with us about the board. Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, having me today. I appreciate um, being considered for a position with the uh, State Board of Medical Licensure. Uh, believe it or not, I'm a native of Florida, so please don't hold that against me. However, I've been a Mississippian since 1996, so I uh, came out of um, training at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, radiation oncology, and I first practiced in Greenville, and then uh, Greenville, Mississippi, and then from uh, Greenville moved down to um, Natchez, where I reside, but still practice. Um, and so I'm proud to be a Mississippian. Um, I don't renounce Florida, that's my birthplace, but uh, interestingly, when I came to Mississippi, my wife said, we're gonna be here five years and out of here. Obviously, I haven't um, kept to that promise. Uh, and that's because we've grown to love Mississippi. Mississippi's been good for us. And uh, it's, a, it's a state that we love and that I enjoy practicing in. I'm, I'm just curious about when it was that you moved to Mississippi. What, what made me move to Mississippi? Interestingly, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I interviewed at five different places and had offers, Las Vegas, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Pittsburgh, 
uh, and also uh, uh, Houston, Texas. And the last place that I, actually I was about to sign a contract to go to, Louise, uh, to uh, Las Vegas, and I got a phone call, and uh, it was a guy, you know, the strong southern drawl that said, hey, you know, consider coming down to Greenville, Mississippi. And down in my basement, we actually had a map of the uh, United States. I said, well, what city? And he said, Greenville. So I actually had to go look at the map, and it wasn't on there. So I had to ask him, well, where is Greenville? Uh, he said, well, it's on the river, about the middle of the state, you know, kind of a straight line across from Jackson. I said, okay, well, look, I'm about to sign a contract to go to Las Vegas, but if you're willing to fly myself, my wife down, so we can take a look um, and be ready to negotiate, and we'll see where it goes from there. So that next week, took a flight down, landed in Jackson, uh, drove up 55, took a left uh, in Winona, uh, and it was hilly, and then I came down this hill right around Greenville, and it went flat. And so I wasn't sure, I was like, whoa, what is this? And I realized that was the Delta, uh, but fell in love with it, just wide open territory, the, uh, cotton was blooming, and I, I just knew this was a place that would be great to uh, plant roots and raise a family. So we had one child at that time, and uh, we've got two products of Mississippi since then. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that drive on Highway 82 when on, on several occasions when there have been people visiting Mississippi and driving down, I direct them to take that very drive and go down that hill <laughs> and it's 100 miles flat to the Mississippi River. It's it, just, it's, uh, yeah. You, yeah. You, you can tell when you're in the Delta. But, but it's beautiful territory and my wife, I mean, I could instantly see, she was just like, you know what, I know what I told you, you know, five years and out, but I think we'll probably be here a long time and so, that, that's how it's materialized. Well, it, it, it also is of interest uh, that you came here from out of state because one of the concerns that we have had with the Board of Medical Licensure over the years is the difficulty that doctors have had historically in getting a license to practice medicine in Mississippi. And we've had numerous discussions. I think that situation is much better now than it was. But I think all of us want the Board of Medical Licensure to ensure that, that those who are providing medical services in Mississippi or to Mississippians are providing good, competent, and safe medical services. But the, the Board should not act as an obstacle to those who are trying to bri uh, provide services, and that's a continuing concern that we have. Well, I agree. Um, the, right, in years past, right, it was a particularly onerous process, extremely slow, and that was a d deterrent. Yeah, from my understanding, most recently, you know, just talking to some physicians who have, you know, applied recently and joined our medical staff, I've asked that question, and they said, eh, you know, it, it's a lot of paper and a lot of due diligence that has to be done. You know, any time you license in a physician, you want to be thorough. Uh, and, and check every box as far as training, uh, credentials, and so forth, and make sure that you know, everything is, is appropriate with regard to um, their background. Uh, but there's always opportunities to streamline things, make it more efficient, um, and, and um, uh, so that it's not a long, drawn-out process. This is a state where we need more physicians, uh, certainly. Um, uh, and, and so anything that we can do that protects the public as far as certifying that an, indivi an individual is, is safe to, to par uh, practice here in, in the state, but also streamline that application process is going to benefit uh, both parties. Well, thank you. Do other members of the committee have questions? Uh, Senator Polk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Givens. Um, during some of the dealings I've had with the Medical Licensure Board the last uh, 10 years that I've been here, I've felt that at times many of your colleagues out in the field have somewhat of what I would call an unhealthy fear of the Medical Licensure Board and what it can do to their profession or their practice. Have you had any 
of your colleagues express that to you? And if so, do you have something in mind that you might offer to see that that unhealthy feeling goes away? I've heard some general comments that, you know, the board is sometimes a little heavy handed, but in those conversations, there was never anything you know, specific. It, it wasn't like a one-on-one -on -one where it was like, hey, this is what happened and does that sound, you know, it was just sort of a general, I would say maybe a little cloud. Um, I do know a number of the members who are currently on the licensure board, and certainly what I can tell you is that, that they are fair and reasonable uh, and have no ax to grind and really would apply the rules and regulations, you know, fairly and as appropriate. Um, but, and, and I would look, should, you know, should I be um, allowed to be on that board? I wouldn't have any reason to, you know, be overbearing or, over, you know, heavy handed with anyone, but certainly would need to look at whatever is brought before us with regard to a complaint. It has to be looked at, uh, evaluated um, with um, fairness in mind, and, but I, I don't see the need to be heavy handed with anyone, unless, of course, the offense is been evaluated and requires some heavy handedness, whether it's you know, um, suspension or, or termination of a license. Um, and so, I mean, that, I think that's the best way I can answer it is, is that at least the individuals that I know, um, and, and that may be from years back and so forth, but at least the current group, I, I think, is uh, reasonable with regard to uh, fair application of the rules and regulations. Anyone else? Uh, Senator Blackwell. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Givens, um, I'm just looking at your the report, peer report here, and, and going back to 2004 through 2012, it looks like you had at least six liens on your business, and it looks like there's still about 60,000 outstanding. Can you help us understand uh, what occurred with your business? To yeah, that, and that was actually something that when I received a call from Mr. Norfleet, uh, Barton Norfleet, um, that uh, caught me completely by surprise. So um, after he mentioned that there were some liens, I contacted my accountant and tax attorney to ask about that. And what it was was when I moved to Mississippi in 96, um, I had a corporation that was called Southern Healthcare Providers. Uh, myself, as well as about two or three hundred other physicians throughout the United States, uh, in setting up the corporation, also had retirement plans. And so there was a group, it was called Zalon, and the retirement plan was administered by Indianapolis Life. Basically what happened was Indianapolis Life, um, along with myself and about 300 other docs throughout the country, ended up uh, establishing a retirement plan that would come to find out was what was called a non-qualified plan. Essentially, the IRS said, hey, this thing is not set up correctly. It is, you know, fraught with problems. And so the IRS said, this thing has to be shut down. What happened then was, of course, other group, the same thing happened with about 300 other physicians. There were tax liabilities that were there. Basically, the IRS said, you have to shut down the corporation, shut down those plans. The IRS essentially, um, along with, I think it was Senator Chuck Grassley, said, look, you guys got into something unbeknownst to your knowledge that was not the physician's fault, but the company's fault. The IRS essentially, um, once they said, if you close this program down, set up a new corporation that has the correct retirement plan structure, will forgive the penalties and so forth that were um, uh, assessed. Um, and then in speaking with my um, tax attorney, apparently that was supposed to also apply to Mississippi. I guess it was like a mem memorandum. And so somewhere in the process of either the state not receiving the memorandum or having the memorandum and not having that cleared up, 
um, those tax liens sat there. Uh, and so I thought it was taken care of, but my current um, uh, accountant is going to say, look, we'll have to get that cleared up moving forward, but that's what it is. So it wasn't a situation of avoiding taxes. It was a retirement plan that was essentially non-compliant as deemed by the IRS. And so um, those penalties were assessed, but we have to get that cleaned up. Other questions? Uh, Senator Parker. Doctor, I just want to say um, first to thank you for your service in our state, particularly uh, in your profession and in your specialty. Um, uh, I find it um, very noble and exciting that you would move to the Delta in your specialty. As you know, uh, your specialty is in great need in the state of Mississippi and in the United States of America. Uh, and uh, in particular, we had uh, another meeting not too long ago where some inference was made to the fact that perhaps we sh perhaps we should be licensing more physicians outside of the state to provide specialty care. Uh, my personal knowledge with your specialty in particular is that that is specialty care that you provide on site and provide in the state of Mississippi. So could you comment to the need for us to not outsource our care to other states, but particularly in specialty situations, the need for us to have physicians with your uh, uh, particular skills in the Delta and throughout the state? Well, Mississippi, I mean, has a critical shortage of physicians, uh, particularly, you know, in, in rural areas. Um, the, I think the best thing, and actually one of the things that uh, the hospital in Greenwood is doing is basically trying to grow our own. There's a ton of bright students here in the Delta and down on the coast and throughout the state that um, through expansion of say like you know the rural scholars pro program and so forth allows us to grow grow our own and the reason for that is that basically physicians or individuals who are from here tend to stay here you know you've got a family extended family grandma it's unlikely that you're going to finish medical school, start practice here, and then all of a sudden pick off and pick up and leave and go to San Francisco if you've got a successful practice. Um, using outside physicians for that sort of work might kind of be a temporary band-aid possibly, but it, I don't see it as a, a long-term solution. I think the thing is investing in our own, growing our own, um, being really the best long-term viable situation. Uh, because that's going to have lasting uh, results for generations to come. And, and as a follow-up, um, my wife is um, someone who's battling colorectal cancer. Sorry to and hear so that. I'm very familiar uh, with your specialty in particular. Uh, can you comment on any increases or changes that you've seen in colon cancer or colorectal cancer in your area or in the state and any need that you might see that we get awareness through this committee uh, towards the importance of um, colonoscopy perhaps at an earlier age or anything you think you can do through the Board of Medical Licensure to bring attention to that issue? Well, and I'll expand that a little bit. Cancer in general, you know, we need to heighten awareness whether it's breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, we have a high rate of uh, tobacco use, and unfortunately, um, we, we have pe pe people that present at a late stage and late diagnosis. And so the key is actually early detection, and we preach that across the board. As far as colonoscopies, um, in, in general, we recommend that that you know, be at age 50. However, if someone's having, and, and I don't want to get too far into medicine, but you know, if you're having some abnormal symptoms, you know, rectal bleeding and so forth, you know, you certainly want to see a physician. And if a colonoscopy, and again, the screening colonoscopy is recommended at age 50. I'm 55. I had mine five years ago, and I survived it without any problem. They knock you out, and you don't remember anything. Um, but certainly, if you've got any severe symptoms that need to be evaluated, certainly consult a physician. Um, but colonoscopies, mammograms, low-dose CT scans looking for lung cancer, uh, and even, you know, we've got 
a real problem as far as access to health care, um, whether, uh, you know, for uh, underserved population, and then also people tend to neglect and put things off. We, we tend to procrastinate until uh, things become severe. So, you know, I, I'm trying to answer your question, but then also go a higher level. We, we've really got to step up early detection, uh, and, and then it also applies to diabetes and hypertension. You know, as a, as a state, um, we really have to step up um, early intervention um, with regard to health care uh, in, in all phases. Thank you. Any more questions? Anyone else? Is there a motion? There's a motion to advise and consent. Is there a debate? Are you ready to vote? All in favor say aye. All opposed, no. Eyes appear to have it. The eyes have it. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate your coming to be with us, and thank you for being willing to serve on this board. Thank you. Appreciate your consideration. The next uh, uh, item on the agenda is Senate nomination 68, Ryan Charles Harper to the State Board of Pharmacy. Thank you for coming to be with us. Thank you for being willing to serve. Uh, just tell us a, a bit about yourself and about the board. Well, like the previous physician, uh, I'm also a transplant. I was born and raised in New Orleans, attended school in Monroe. That's where my, my wife from Pelahatchie, Mississippi. Uh, so the culture shock of myself moving back to Pelahatchie and raising a family, I'm still overcoming. I've been introduced to a septic tank and its problems. Uh, I'm my wife's fourth generation pharmacist in that little town. Ever since it's been incorporated, it's been her family and probably prior to that my sister, my two brother-in-laws, my father-in-law. That's all we know. Uh, it doesn't make for a fun time around the house if you're not a pharmacist, because our jokes fall flat. Uh, but I love what I do. I love Mississippi. My three children are Mississippians. Uh, I don't intend to go back home. Um, I've been practicing for around 20 years uh, in Brandon, Mississippi, which is 12 miles from my wife's store. Uh, my, my patient care is everything to me. Mississippians are everything to me. Uh, I take it very seriously. Uh, I, I think what, as, a, as serving on the board for the past five years, we've done a, a great job addressing some of the problems we've had. Um, like the chairman noted, uh, the vaccination issues. We allowed for those special um, transfers. We also put on our website some web links for the those two chain pharmacies for, for pharmacists to apply. Uh, but that being said, uh, we have great leadership, like Dr. Foster mentioned, our executive director, Susan McCoy, is outstanding. We have wonderful staff, uh, very open to anyone to call. Um, and if there's ever anything we can do, please don't hesitate to call us. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. According to the information you provided to the peer committee, you supervise yourself there at Brandon Discount Drugs? That is correct. Um, how, do you, how do you find yourself to be doing there? Are you satisfied with your performance? I, actually, I have great help. And, and thank goodness, uh, one of the best hires I made was my student that, <laughs> out of pharmacy school. She's now my business partner. Uh, you're only as good as your help. And, and so I have wonderful staff. I've had staff that have been with that particular pharmacy longer than I've been alive. <laughs> The store's 52 years old, and one lady's still with us, and she's been there for 52 years. So very fortunate. Uh, to me, independent pharmacy and pharmacy in itself is very uh, intimate. Uh, we, we have an intimate relationship, not just with customers, with patients. We're, we're part of the, the fabric of the, every society, and, and, and I honestly believe we sit, we're in church with these folks, we coach with these folks, uh, and it's, it's very humbling to have someone allow us into their, uh, their lives through their health care. And it's important. We see a lot of folks, uh, especially our widowers and widows, probably more than their families do, and I take that very personally. And their health very personally, and protecting that health very personally. What, what is your sense, if you, if you have one, of the way things will develop with pharmacists under some circumstances being able to prescribe drugs? 
Well, that's, that's going to be up to the physician that will be supervising. That, that protocol is going to be de developed by the physician in coordination with the pharmacist. By no means are we taking any, um, we'll strictly follow the rules as laid out before us. I mean, it, we have to know our lanes. We were not medically trained. We were very well trained, but we have to know what we can do and what we, and more importantly, what we can't do. And that will be described and, and laid out in those protocols. Well, the pharmacists back home, particularly when there are not any doctors around, will say that one of the tasks that they have is to look at medication and to look at all the medication someone is taking and, and make sure that the uh, prescription given by one doctor doesn't have an improper effect based on a prescription given by a different doctor. And I assume there will be a way to continue to perform that function. Uh, that, that's, that's mandated by our regs. So that, we, that will never change. Um, we call that drug utilization review, and it's critical. Uh, and, and I find, especially coming from, I, I guess, metropolis to rural Mississippi, uh, I find that those physicians and prescribers call that pharmacy a whole lot to ask them what they think. And it, it's, that's more of, a, in essence, it's already been a collaborative agreement for decades. It's, it's a good hand-to-hand -hand practice. We do not need uh, siloed medicine. We need, we need to have, you know, we, we need to have a coordinated medicine. And, and I think that, that that's very well played out every day in rural Mississippi, that it, it could be a veterinarian that will call. I know on a daily basis I'll receive calls from local physicians, hey, what do you think? Is this too much for this pediatric patient? Or hey, what do you think? It's going to interact too much with Miss Sally's medicine she takes at night. And that's critical. Questions? Comments? Senator Kirby. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Kirby. That's humbling. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, is there a motion? We have a motion to advise and consent. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Eyes appear to have it. The eyes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate yes, your visiting with us. Yes, sir. Please keep in touch with us. We rely on those who know what they're doing to give us information and advice. That'd be great. So, yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is Senate nomination number 88, uh, Dr. M Michelle Yvette Taylor to the State Board of Medical Licensure. Uh, Dr. Dr. Owens, thank you for coming to be with us. We saved you for last for two reasons. Uh, 88 is a, a bigger number than the others, and then you're from right here in Jackson, so you don't have to drive back to Olive Branch when this is over, so there's that. But, no, that's uh, fine. Tell us a, a little bit about yourself and uh, how things are going. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to appear today. Um, I'm Michelle Owens, and I have, um, since 2016, served on the State Board of Medical Licensure. I have practiced here in Jackson. Um, I came here in 2004 uh, as a trainee, and then in 2007, upon completion of my fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, um, didn't leave. And um, so I have had a practice that has kind of encompassed the breadth and depth of obstetrics and gynecology here and in 2016 had the distinct honor of um, being able to serve on the State Board of Medical Licensure. Um, since my time on the board, um, I have also become part of the executive committee and uh, currently serve as the board secretary. Um, I've also headed the scope of practice committee and our um, committee on communications. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is um, the new tool that we've created, which we've reinstated our newsletter in order to help connect with our licensees and to spread educational information as it pertains to rules and regulations. Um, it is my belief that physicians don't wake up in the morning with the intentions of breaking rules. 
and so we like to make sure that we are making rules and regulations accessible and available and also to promote um, the board actions so that we are transparent as a board and people are aware of the information. Um, so those have been some of the things that, that I've been working on during the time that I've been on the State Board of Medical Licensure. It has been um, one of the exciting things that I've gotten to do in the course of my career. I'm very grateful for the opportunity and would love to continue to serve. Thank you. One of the uh, concerns that we've had over the years with the State Board of Medical Licensure is their enthusiasm about, uh, it, it seems to some of us, uh, restricting doctors from out of state who wish to come here and practice. We think that's getting better. Um, but that is an, an ongoing concern of ours is is walking the line between making sure that the medical services that are being provided in the state are uh, safe and, and the uh, providers are, are doing well, but at the same time having the issue of accessibility to healthcare. So we'll be hoping you can help us continue to uh, yes. uh, look at that. Are there questions from anyone else? Senator Blackwell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Owens, I uh, see you're an OB-GYN. Yes, sir, I am. Um, would like your opinion on uh, on a matter. In uh, Medicaid, we have, uh, have or coming up is what we call our technical bill. Basically, we go through, and there's been a proposal. As you may know, we cover uh, only up to 60 days uh, for coverage, and now with the CARES Act, it's unlimited. But there's a proposal to uh, extend that coverage up to a year for postpartum care for women. Could you uh, maybe elaborate and give us your opinion on the importance of uh, extending that prenatal care to that that's 12 months? Absolutely. Um, I am very much supportive of that. Um, I am an OBGYN, but I'm also a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And so as a result, I take care of those women who have medical complications in pregnancy. Many of those women have um, chronic medical conditions prior to pregnancy, or they develop conditions during their pregnancy that increase their risk for complications afterwards. Um, so it, this is something that specifically affects me and is a big part of my practice. I see women who have poor pregnancy outcomes because they've not had good care prior to becoming pregnant and because people haven't really spoken to them or adequately educated them about the ways that they might not become pregnant considering their medical complications. They haven't had um, enough time to be involved in the healthcare system to actually get control of their medical complications. And then on top of it, they have a pregnancy. So the best way to have a healthy pregnancy or a healthy baby is to have a healthy mom. And so we get a chance to, to catch them when they're pregnant because fortunately, many of them will, um, will get care through Medicaid. But then once they lose that, all of that hard work evaporates and then the cycle starts all over again. Um, mo this is most important, not just in overall health, but in mortality. If we're talking about reducing mortality, extending that care for a year can make a difference because the maternal mortality rates in the United States are not great. Um, and in Mississippi, they are specifically difficult. The numbers are not great either. Um, we kind of lead the nation um, are amongst the highest in the nation in our maternal mortality statistics. So when you think about the significant impact that that can make, not only for the mothers of Mississippi, but for Mississippi families, most people don't expect to not have their mom with them when they celebrate their first birthday. And unfortunately, in this country and in this state, that is too often a reality. And, and this particular intervention, just extending care and allowing them to remain plugged in with us and our other colleagues that can get them better, more fine-tuned care for their specific problems and follow up in that first year will make a huge difference in overall mortality and I think ultimately will increase their overall health. Well, this, this is amazing, Dr. Owens. It, it seems you're in agreement with the Senate position on this matter. Well, of course, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Senator Wiggins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Dr. Owens. 
So the, the pining question here is, uh, if you could really, is it, uh, tell us how it really is being married to a lawyer and a prosecutor at that, because if it's like my wife says, she says it's the greatest thing in the world. It, look, being married to an attorney is, is the best thing. Um, I don't get a chance to win, but uh, I'm not, I have learned to refine my arguments and be a little bit more convincing and persuasive from time to time. Um, but I, does he, I make, does I'm he being, make you call I'm him doctor, doctor too, because he is a doctor of law? Well, we, we've had conversations from time to time um, about whose doctorate um, is most appropriate for the issues that we are facing in the home. From, from <laughs> so sometimes the JD wins and sometimes the MD gets to be the law. <laughs> No, um, Mr. Chairman, I don't really have a question. I just have a comment to say that, uh, and to Senator Blackwell's point, Dr. Owens was a, um, very helpful to me as Medicaid chairman and has done a lot for uh, educating the legislators, to be honest, on those type of things. And I think that she has, um, is certainly deserving and well qualified to be on there. And her husband, has taken on a good job, uh, uh, D.A. Owens, and I appreciate what they do for Hines County and for this state because they certainly are uh, giving of themselves, and I would uh, certainly recommend them, obviously. Anyone else? Senator Blunt? Uh, I'd like to be recognized for a motion, Mr. Chairman, but before I am, I'd like to say, and I knew coming in here uh, that Dr. Owens is a real star, and uh, I've known her uh, almost as long as her husband has. And uh, she's, she, both of them do a lot for our community, and I think not only is she doing a great job in her, in her day job, but I think she's doing a great job on the board. And I also want to say, I know, look, it's, it's a very busy time. We're all in a crunch time right now. But I mean, the five people that we've heard from today are all, I, I, I feel like every one of them was very impressive. And, and they're also very intelligent, smart people, and they're doing this uh, because they want to. And I, I mean, I just, I can't remember going to, a, we've done a bunch of these this year, I can't remember going to a committee meeting where we had a number of, of appointees uh, to advise and consent on it. Every one of them was just really sharp, good appointments. And uh, so, uh, but my favorite is Dr. Owens, and with that being said, I would move that we do advise and consent. You ready to vote? There's a motion to advise and consent. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Thank you, Dr. Owens. I, I appreciate your coming to visit with us. Uh, we've had you and the other nominees come down today because these are important positions and it, it helps the committee to, to have these discussions. So thank you for coming by and let us hear from you uh, as, as time goes by if, if there's information you have for us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Members of the committee, we have four other nominations that are in the committee. Uh, I think we have uh, peer committee reports that we can hand out. These four nominations will not involve appearances before the committee, so my suggestion is, since we're all here, we'll just take the time to look through these peer committee reports, and uh, if there's a motion, we can consider all, all four of these, and I believe that will complete our agenda for the year. So if we take a bit more time today, since we, we have a quorum, and I think we can all agree amongst ourselves, it's a very fine quorum as quorums go, and um, work through these other four uh, appointments.
Does anyone have any questions or concerns or anything about any of these, Senator uh, Wiggins? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess the motion was in block. I'd like to set aside the last one, Mr. Parker. Okay. Or have a question, really. Okay. Of the chair. Uh, on the last, it's noted that uh, he's been appointed as a licensed massage therapist yet his license is not is expired and peer has stated is not i guess it doesn't fit for what he's being appointed to has that been looked into is that is there some um, mitigating factor it's certainly for the committee to decide i have no strong feelings one way or another i know that over the years in appointments to committees that are not as uh, I hate to use the term important, but, but not, a, not a committee like the State uh, Board of Health or the Board of Medical Licensure, that the various Senate committees in considering confirmations have been uh, more broad-minded in interpreting the statutory requirements. Uh, but that does not mean that the committee necessarily would need to do that in this situation. And probably the best way to proceed is to take up the other three and then come back to this one unless, unless someone suggests otherwise. Senator Parker. In, in looking through that a little bit more, uh, Chairman Wiggins, it, it appears in my read of that that the appointment, and in full disclosure, I don't know Mr. Parker, he's no relationship to, to myself. Um, it, it appears he's retired. He's a retiree now um, from the profession, and and it looks like that might be the reason for that discrepancy. That does say the board staff confirmed that he was in good standing when he retired. Um, I, like you, I don't know his age, uh, but I do think that in certain instances, someone who um, has served their profession well, but who has retired from the profession, might still be an adequate representation to the profession uh, well, on the board as a whole? Well, I certainly would think that since we're debating this, but I hate, I mean, the, the law says a, the law says a licensed massage therapist. Well, l let me ask this, are there, why don't we take the other three up in block? Is, is there objection to doing that? Uh, Okay, without objection, we'll take up the other three in block. That would be Senate nominations 34, 48, and 84. Is there debate or discussion about them? Are you ready to vote on those? The motion would be do advise and consent on those three. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. We'll report those to the Senate. And now I will call up item um, 94. And I think that the statutory requirement is set forth here. In the, in the, in the peer committee report. It is, it, I don't have the statute, but looking at the peer summary of the statute, it says, must have engaged in the practice of massage therapy for at least three years. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that parsing that, the statute actually says when those three years must be. Mr. Chairman, I, I too was interested in what that statute actually says because my question about this is does it have to be a lot, um, well, <clears throat> excuse me, according to the peer summary here, it has to be a licensed therapist. And if that's what the legislature said and it's enacting legislation 
and he's not, then there was some reason for the legislature doing that. I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill, but um, I'm also looking at the slippery slope arguments that can come about when we are exercising our duties here. So um, I guess the question I have is, is he, if he's not licensed, is that not part of, is that against the law as set out? Uh, if you're asking me for my opinion, uh, there have been circumstances in the past in which nominees with uh, more problematic situations than this one have been approved. That does not mean that's what the committee has to do, but it, 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 it would not be unprecedented for us to uh, be very liberal in interpreting the, the, the statute. But again, I'm, I'm not asking the committee to do anything. I'm just trying to answer your question. Well, since I raised the issue, uh, considering to Senator Parker's point, about the retirement, I do see that in here that he was at the time a license that I wouldn't have any objection going forward. I just think that if this comes up again and maybe more, uh, what you call it, um, higher level board, that it's something we need to just keep our eye on. Well, since you've raised that issue, I think that we confirm all sorts of people that there's really no need for us to confirm. And I've tried to focus the issue on the, focus on the more major appointments where I, I think it's where it's like the meeting today, I think this is very productive. And I wish somebody somewhere would change the law to relieve us of having to confirm a number of these positions. But at any rate, is there further debate or discussion? Senator Blackwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to point out that uh, this is a reappointment for this gentleman, and he currently looks like serves as the chairman. So he, he may be well qualified. Well, but that, well, the law says, uh, well, that goes back to my point. Heaven forbid I actually focus on the law, but um, it may be a license, and he's still not licensed, so, um, and, but I think that works in his favor, certainly. And so, I mean, we are tell passing, me, law, we are passing again, laws up here, aren't we? Senator, Senator Wiggins, I forget. What was it you did before you got this job? Well, as I've said, lawyer three times this meeting, so. Worse than a lawyer. I think you were a prosecutor. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, well, may we recognize? Man. Would it be inappropriate if we, this is not a motion, I'm asking you as the chair, what if we decided to lay this on the table, subject to call the chair, you take it up with the candidate and ask him, could he reinstate his license, and that would resolve the matter. Well, I, I guess we could, could do that if that's what the uh, committee wants to do. Well, that would, require, that would require us to come back, and I think you said that this is, I appreciate what Senator McMahon's saying, um, and he's retired, so he probably wouldn't reinstate his license. Um, I, I'll move this on. I raised the issue, and my motion would be to advise and consent. Okay, we, we have a motion then to advise and consent. Is there any other debate, motions? But Mr. Chairman, I have a question, or just to make a point. In, Senator in reading, if Before we vote, I just want to point out that, that the, in reading the peer staff conclusion, it said the board consists of five members, three of which must have engaged in the massage therapy within for three, the last three years. In addition, one member must be a licensed health professional in other in other field other than massage therapy, and one member shall be a consumer at large. So maybe he could qualify as the consumer at large, potentially, if we get down to that point. Well, just for the record, the governor's letter said he was being appointed as a licensed massage therapist, not the consumer. Maybe. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I think we've demonstrated, I know I've had this talk with Senator Wiggins before, but it appears that we, we do have a few committees that, that might have a few too many lawyers on them. <laughs> and so at, at, at some point I suggest we, we do indeed move all the lawyers to Judd A and Judd B. 
Well, of course, <laughs> the, the other argument wasn't is... There, wasn't there an optometrist bill this year? The other, the other argument is there the was. lawyers may be doing less damage on this committee than they would elsewhere. <laughs> is there further debate? <laughs> Are we ready to vote? All in favor of the motion to advise and consent, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes appear, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Uh, thank you for coming. I, I know there's a lot going on. It's a hectic time, and you, everybody has other places to be. But I think it was uh, meaningful to the people who took the trouble to come down here that we had good attendance. So thank you for that. Is there a motion to rise and report? All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it.